say, well, my head says, obviously those guys didn't thaw any frozen pipes in, fe in February this year because <laughs> when ice melts, it contracts, it expands when it freezes, so, so it broke the pipes, so the fact that those, the sea ice melts means the water level should go down. So while I'm, I'm, you know, right into conservation and all these things, I don't like it when they lie to us. And, and so, so when, when we have things that are common knowledge versus common sense, um, that's, that's what I think that I've tried to do with this whole program of fence row farming. So, so I'm going to show you the picture of this orchid, and, I, and you're going to say, what, what the heck has an orchid got to do with growing corn and soybeans? Well, this orchid has a kind of a neat story. Uh, I used to, I was trying to grow orchids, and I would buy one at the store, and I'd get my stick with three flowers on it, and I'd follow the instructions, a little tag that comes with it, I'd do exactly what they said, and I am positive that the reason for that tag is so that they can sell more orchids. <laughs> because invariably, I'd kill this orchid by doing it, and I'd put it in a new pot with new soil, and I did all these things. So anyway, my daughters gave me this orchid for Father's Day about seven years ago. So it was in Ottawa, I trucked the thing home, I figured that the ride would kill it if nothing else, and so I get it home and I stick it in a north window in my office and, and just didn't pay attention to it. So I watered it once a week or once every two weeks if I thought about it. And so the thing died down like it always did and I just forgot about it. I said no sense in you know, fussing about that. And so anyway, then a little shoot comes out of the thing. And so time went on, and this thing kept growing shoots and growing, doing things. And so common logic, common knowledge would tell me that I was supposed to pamper it and do something with it. But common sense would tell you that orchids grow in a rock or in a tree trunk, and they like it when their roots are restricted. So this orchid still is in its its first pot, the original little pot that the orchid came in. I left it in that because just like an orchid in the wild, the roots grow over into the next pot. I put another pot around it so it had another rock to grow into. And and that's that's the, the common sense approach that made this orchid, there's 123 blossoms on that orchid. It's, it's incredible. And it, it's, it looks just like that this morning in my office. It's just loaded. The first first blooms come in February and they fall off the last one in October. It's just an amazing plant. So, corn and soybeans. Uh, or somebody to run my clear. <laughs> okay. Pushing this button, is that right? Or back here, back here, okay. Okay. So, corn and soybeans, uh, Haldeman County, uh, who could imagine that you could grow corn and soybeans like this? The genetics, and I, and I have to say something, uh, you know, we're talking about different seed companies and everything, and Pioneer, I have to give them some credit because they, they started this contest. And I entered the contest, and because I'd been up prep for, for 20 years working, or at that time about uh, 16 years, trying to, to perfect this fence row farming system that I have, I won the yield contest. And that gave me the, the, the platform, if you will, to go around and talk to people about this. And so, so I'm excited about contests because, you know, it's, it's like the, we were down in, uh, in um, where was it in uh, Nashville? Sorry, and uh, the guy stands up there and he says, and his you know southern drawl kind of thing. He says, you know, those guys when they're trying to catch Bin Laden, he said all they had to do was give away a boat and a truck, and then rednecks around here they'd have had that guy in three days. <laughs> If you go on your farm 
and you look at the soil in the fence row, you'll find soil that's as good as you can get. That's what you can do with your farm if you could keep that fence row soil. And so how did, it, how did all this start? Well, when I was, uh, we were talking about how old you are when you drive tractors. I was 10, but I tell everybody it's 14 because I mean the, the children's services would have had my mother and dad in, the, in jail. Uh, but anyway, so around 14, I was plowing, and uh, we had a two for a plow, and we got rid of that and got a three for a plow. So now we're plowing 12 inches closer to the fence row. So I turned over that soil, and I can remember it, I was 14, and even though it was over 25 years ago, <laughs> I can remember the soil looked like these little sugar cubes. And I didn't know what it was, but it was perfect soil structure. So the three for a plow gives way to the five for a plow, and we plowed through the fence row. So the first year, we've all done that, we plowed up the fence row, and the first year, corn is two feet taller in the fence row. So that stuck in my head, the, the, the new plow stuck in my head. But in the meantime, we had um, we'd gone away from the farm, sold the dairy, came back, uh, bought the farm next door, and started a berry farm. And on the berry farm, my absolute favorite piece of equipment was the rototiller. I could rototill the strawberries back into rows, I could cut back the, the, the raspberry canes, uh, turn down the sweet corn, you know, whatever it was, the rototiller was, was the best piece of equipment I had. So we sold the berry farm and the fellow came from the Holland Marsh and he came and said, I would like to grow carrots. Yeah, I think you can grow carrots. Yeah, you know, we have a loamier, it's clay down about two feet. Uh, there's a bit of sand and loam and mixed in with the clay. And so, yeah, I think you can grow carrots. So the carrots grew, they looked fantastic. And when it came time to dig the carrots, they had gone down and they hit the hard pan that I had created with the rototiller. And they went sideways. So there's not a lot of market for L-shaped carrots. <laughs> so, so those three events said to me, and, and at that time we'd, we'd sold and so we were back now on the home farm. And so I determined that I had to create a fence row, soil. I, I wanted to have the soil that was in that fence row every 30 inches across the farm. So that means that I plant, I plant right into the root balls of the old crop. Now I do corn soybeans back and forth. Um, I took this picture because you know that corn plant is growing right over top of a corn stalk. There's a corn stalk right beside it and it's growing right up beside it. So there's been a lot of challenges in the equipment, trying to get the equipment that will do that. But fence row farming is planting exactly on the same row forever. I don't move over four inches. I don't move anywhere. So the track of the wheel is always in the same place. The band of fertilizer between twin rows is always in the same place. And the plants are growing alternately in the same place. Corn on the soybean plant. And I split the root ball right open and plant the soybean seed right into that corn root ball. So, been some real challenges getting that stuff to grow, but I mean, it's, it's phenomenal, the results. So the first year it didn't look great, that's, that's our farm. Uh, lots of drainage problems, I tiled it. Uh, the, clay, the clay content in the soil tends to wash over, so we just, we just don't even think about growing wheat. Um, but then it started getting better. And so the drainage started improving, the tile started working better, those root paths and wormholes and everything got the water away. And so uh, in 2011, it was an extremely wet year. We, we got rain continually. In 2012, it was just dried up. The lawn was brown and, uh, and, and yet it still did, did well. So we get incredible growth. Uh, I mean, and the other thing, and I should back that up just a minute. 
So the strip of, of corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans is not fence row farm. That's, I, I do that so I can get in to spray corn and different things, uh, but the, the key to it is that I'm planting on the same row. It's, it's the fence row, it's every 30 inches, so whether I did it with solid corn or solid beans, and I do that, I, I plant solid corn to beat the, the, uh, the, the resistance, the weed resistance, so that I'm not always using Roundup, glyphosate, sorry. So, I mean, we get incredible growth. Uh, the way it's set up is, uh, I've changed this a little bit since this slide, but we, we have um, the rows, I guess this has got a clicker here. I don't know where I'm out of everybody's way. Okay, so there's, there's a row of corn here and corn here, so it's same for soybean, corn or soybeans. Dry fertilizer goes in the center and for the corn, there's 28% goes on each side. And so in the corn, our actual is 205 of nitrogen. That's up to 60, uh, no, that, that's 54, sorry. The, and the potash, I moved that up to 60 of potash. And um, we're, we're regularly at uh, right between 280 and 300 bushels with that. So our actual, uh, we're 0.7 pounds of nitrogen, 0.2 pounds of potash or phosphorus, and this is also now 0.2 pounds of potash to to hit those numbers. So my new favorite piece of equipment, now that I've got rid of the rototiller, is the power parachute. So I take off off the lawn with this thing. Um, the main reason that I got it was for scaring birds. We have birds coming out of the river, and uh, they'll come in and, and rip that cob open. The water gets in it. I get mold, get grade five. I mean, they they really do a number if you let them, the birds. And so I go up there and I scare it. But the other thing, once you're up there, you see everything that you did. So it's humbling to see your, your crop from the air. So I, I recommend go to the local airport uh, get somebody that needs some flying time and uh, take you up and have a look at your field from the air because you can see so many things. I mean, the drones are out there now and can give you these the aerial photographs, but it's never the same as actually first-hand seeing it. So this is a great thing for, for that. Um, the eyes on the chute are for scaring the birds. The black and yellow help to scare. So... So the other part of it is the crop scouting, being able to see it. But I found out it's really a great thing for keeping track of your neighbors. <laughs> so this is a neighboring field. It looks a lot like my field used to look. And so this guy, there's no tile there. Uh, that's the type of land that we have around there. There's hard blue clay down a little ways. No drainage out the bottom. Uh, this guy is not farming. He's just annoying the ducks. <laughs> so another neighbor, his field, uh, he's, he's got a tile, but he's still cultivating. And so our, our soil, if you smear it, if you mess it up with a cultivator, um, it just won't drain. And so the drainage is, is impacted. And so the fence row farming has just made that drainage open up so much for us. And this neighbor... I'll give you a minute. <laughs> He's sharecropping. And for there, anybody that hasn't got that yet, this is marijuana growing in the field here next door. <laughs> so, to me, the secret of all this, or at least it was until I met George, the secret is to get out of their way. And, and so in this, in this slide, we have three things. You can see that after, this is after 18 years of continual fence row farming, there's very little stuff on the surface. Like there, the, the tons and tons of organic matter that came from the corn and soybean crop is pretty well gone. 
So then the other thing that you see is all these little st stacks of straw. Those are called middens. And if you've heard Odette, uh, she talks about her worms and, and what they're doing. And the third thing that I want you to see in this picture, which is probably the most incredible, is that every, this is late September and every corn leaf that's touching the ground is already down a wormhole six inches. They're pulling the leaves of my corn crop. Now when the suckers get up and start taking the cobs, I better say, well, that's enough. But anyway, but anyway so you can see the worm activity there is just incredible. So then I talk about George. So, so this one day, I got a call, and this was, I don't know, a couple or three years after, a couple of years after I was here. Uh, the pioneer guy from Quebec calls up and he says, well, we'd like you to come down and speak at our meeting in Quebec. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I gotta go to the airport, take my shoes off, a couple days. So I was not really that excited about going to Quebec. But anyway, he says, well, where's your closest airport? And he said, well, it's in, Ham I said, I'm in Hamilton, but they can't fly out of there. I have to go to Toronto to get a flight. And he said, well, leave it with me. So he calls back in a couple hours, says, all set up. What? We're coming with the corporate jet to pick you up in Hamilton. So you know you're paying too much for seed corn wet. <laughs> okay. So, but it wasn't just for me. So the jet was leaving Des Moines, Iowa, DuPont jet. It flew over to Missouri and picked up Kip Colors. Uh, anybody that doesn't know Kip Colors, he's the guy that got 162 bushel of soybeans. So he's the soybean champion. Then they fly to Hamilton, pick me up, fly to Montreal, it's like a lawn dart. That thing just went up and back down again, like boom, you're in, in, in Montreal. So anyway, I get on this plane, and here's Kip Colors, and I don't know if any of you have listened to him or, or seen him, but he's sitting there in this $10 million jet with his feet up on the, on the leather seats, chewing tobacco, spitting in a cup. <laughs> He and, 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 and so he says, you know, if they want me to do these things, they're going to have to haul me around. And that's why we're on this here jet. <laughs> okay. So it was fun. I mean, I got to meet, meet, meet Kip, and we've been at different things together. And while the ladies go off to the flea markets, Kip and I will sit on the bench, and we'll talk about growing soybeans. Anyway, so we get to Montreal. And I, there's three people on the program. There's Kip Colors, there's myself, and there's George Lazarovitz from a &L Labs. I felt like the opening act for Johnny Cash, right? Everybody was Kip Colors, Kip Colors, and they're excited about him. And so anyway, at lunchtime, they're all over at his table, and George and I kind of sat over by ourselves in the corner. And, and so George says, you know, there's something else going on in your field besides just soil structure. And so he said, George from a and Biological in London, he comes down to our farm and he sets up a test plot. So he spent something in the order of two hundred to $300,000 now researching the results in my field, what, what's going on. Now I'm pushing. Okay, so he got a crew out there and they're... Uh, in our field, they're, they're doing tests and flags everywhere. They're also doing it on the neighbor's farm. And so uh, Clarence Hessels, um, he's also in Pioneer, he's got a, a fertilizer business, so his fertility is right up there, but he works all the ground. He, he plows, discs, everything. So his corn comes up, boom, right away. It's it laid in there. Uh, ours is a little shaky and slow coming up because it's it's kind of fighting and it doesn't have a nice perfect seed bed to, to work with. But Clarence's just looks green and beautiful. Um, and you compared the plants and the color and everything else and mine's getting off to a slow start and uh, George thought he was wasting his time. He came and he looked at this corn and man just doesn't look good. So anyway, when we got all said and done, Clarence has yielded pretty good for the area and what he's been used to getting. He got 162 bushel. And we had 249 bushel on the same plot. 
So George is like, like, what is going on? And so he started researching. He started taking the, the juice out of the plant. And so he'd squeeze the juice out of the plant and culture the bacteria. So in the, on this dish, the thing is completely covered with bacteria growth. And in Clarence's, the conventional, there's spots here and there. So the first thing to think about is that there's a whole bunch more bacteria in the fence row farming side than there is in the conventional side. So then the other thing to look at on those discs is this is very uniform and only a couple of variations where this one is all over the map. There's a whole bunch of things happening. So when I got done, um, George, when you talk to George, you kind of get a glare, glassed over look because well, he's talking all this biological stuff and I, I lose him really quickly. And so I said, I need to have this so that I can explain it to people. And so he said, well, the groups of bacteria, so the bacteria, the green one um, is our, our farm. So those are the green bacteria, those are the fence row farming, and these are the conventional. And so in terms of bacteria, it's like comparing zebras and kangaroos. They're completely different. They're different bacteria, even though it's the same it's like it was uh, P0216 was the variety, both exactly the same variety. And so in the fence row farming, the top one, now I want you guys to memorize all these names here because there's a test at the end. But anyway, George is saying there's seven different families of bacteria there. And in the conventional, there's 26 families of bacteria. He said, George, how can I explain that to anybody? He said, well, okay. It's like building a barn. Okay, so Clarence is going to build a barn, and I'm going to build a barn. So I go out, and I get seven professional contractors to help me build the barn. Clarence goes out and gets 26 guys off the street to help him build the barn. He's got more, but they're not specialized. And in addition because of that, that uh, Petri dish that you saw, mine is totally covered. I have a hundred crews of seven professional contractors and Clarence just has the 26 guys. So in an effort to prove this and show what the results were, one of the experiments that he did, he took the roots of the corn, he pulled it out and he shook all the dirt off. So then there's a very small amount of dirt that's still adhering to the root. So the dirt that's closest to the root, he took that and tested it. So you know all about available nutrients. There's so much available at a certain time. So, so he looked at the available, I don't know which it was, nitrogen or phosphorus, but anyway, the available nutrients in that soil that, he, that came off of the root. He looked at the how much is still left. So at the end of 60 days, in the conventional, the dirt that fell off of Clarence's roots, there was 60% of the available nitrogen, phosphorus, had been taken up by the plant. And at the end of 60 days in the fence row farming, something like 92% of the available nutrients had been taken up by the plant. So there's something in those bacteria that are like superheroes that are being able to extract the nutrients more efficiently from the soil. So the end result, um, you know, our, our beans have struggled a little bit. I mean, 72 bushels is respectable, but it should be 100 bushel to compare with 300 bushel of corn. Um, the beans set it up for the for the corn. Um, the beans are planted into the into the uh, root balls of the corn. Um, I forgot one thing. I, I got to back up. George, I forgot to tell you about George. One thing that just happened, and if you saw it in the, uh, the London Free Press, I don't know whether you get that around here or not, but anyway. So George, originally when he set up his test plot, had 
got funding from the uh, Ontario Grain Growers, and so they were funding him, he was funding it himself, and last year he had no funding. So he continued. He continued with his plot and testing on his own, ANL Biological footing the bill. So about uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I was in London for the presentation, and he got $1.7 million research grant for continuing the research in my field. So we're hoping that, like he's, I guess he's hoping he wants to find the magic formula so we can put it in a bottle and sell it to you guys. But it's, it's, it's research dollars that are hopefully gonna push it forward and get hard answers as to why and where and how this stuff is all, is, is all happening. So it's, it's pretty exciting, uh, it's, it's, it keeps on going. So the beans, so then the corn, uh, we, our high yield in the corn has been, um, it was 301 and then the sec last year it was 301 again, so we kind of plateaued there. So we're trying some, uh, trying to do some fun, uh, foliar feeding a little bit to see if we can, again, it's a contest, right? So um, we've got a guy in Norfolk County that's hit 327 uh, with, uh, he's got underground irrigation and he's feeding it. Uh, he, he puts, I put 210 pounds of nitrogen on, he puts 400 pounds of nitrogen on. So, so I mean, that's an expensive, you know, 26 bushel or whatever we got. But, but the yield potential is incredible. They, they just broke a, the 500 bushel mark in the States. Um, there's a guy in, it wasn't Dave Hula. Dave Hula got 479 or something, and this other guy in Virginia or Georgia or somewhere, he got uh, 502 or something. So, I mean, I don't even know what 500 bushel of corn would look like going into the combine. But it's fun combining 300 bushel corn. So what makes it work? So tile drainage, RTK system. Uh, originally when I started out, I would have said there's nobody would be having the patience to do this because I was trying to line it up and keep it on the row by leaving an old row of corn stock that I followed and all that kind of stuff. Now with the RTK, everybody can do this and everybody, including the machinery companies, have to get on board with controlled traffic. The um, controlled traffic is so important to keep, you don't, I, I never drive on where I'm growing crops. And uh, if you start doing the math and you figure out how these big wide tires, how much of your field you're driving over it, it's, it's gonna be you know, 70, 80% of the field you're driving over. So the soil structure and fence row farming, Bacteria colonization, which is what George is working on and trying to figure out. Controlled traffic, um, like you should never take a hay wagon, hay uh, forage harvester into the field. You shouldn't take anything that isn't driving on the same track as the rake, the grain buggy, the combine, whatever it is. Controlled traffic is, is incredibly important to making this thing work. Banding the fertilizer. I think I get away with less fertilizer than my, my buddy in Norfolk County because I've been putting that band in exactly the same place for 20 years. And it's, it's just always in. It's always in the same place. The, the roots, it's right beside where the roots are growing. Um, it, spreading fertilizer, I just do not spread anything. Natural fertilizer in production, one of the things that uh, he was doing in the plot was he, was he was testing availability. And during the growing season, my availability of phosphorus went from 10% up to 18%. So the bacteria and the, the protozoa, whatever is working in that soil, the earthworms are releasing those nutrients. Deep root penetration, I've got roots right down below the tile. So drought proofing, I mean those roots are, are so deep that it doesn't, it doesn't matter, dry weather does not affect us very much. Drainage, 
Uh, so the other parts of it, the twin rows, I really like twin rows because if you've got one plant missing, I'd rather, far rather have plants missing than doubles. I don't want a double ever because the one cob is the, those two cobs are open. So that my row, that, and that one always has two really big full cobs on it if there's one missing next to it. So the twin rows, I can't imagine getting that yield, but I mean, they are in the States, so they're getting big yields and not using twin rows, but I like the twin rows. The strip cropping, um, it, has, it has an impact. I get about probably 20 more bushel of corn per acre and probably lose three or four bushel of soybeans because of the shading. But I plant my rows perfectly east-west so that there's, there's very little shading. The sun shine, comes up, shines right down the row. I have a backfield that I can't plant that direction. It's just too short a row, it's a long skinny field. And so that one is planted north and south. And the beans, let me see, on the east side of the beans that are shaded the most in the morning, those beans are definitely shorter. I've never taken yield samples from them, but the shading in the morning seems to have a bigger impact than the shading in the afternoon. So I had a number of groups out, and this, this one lady was in there, and she said, where is it okay to step? It was after I'd showed her all these worms and everything. And so if you get that, that mindset, where is it okay to step in your field, then you're a long ways toward getting that fence row soil in your farm. So whether you're growing orchids or you're growing corn, they both prefer common sense. Any questions? How many years did it take till you really seen the yields go up? Yeah, it took a, the <coughs> initially. I mean, it looked pretty tough, and I was trying to create those the, that <coughs> row, and uh, it probably took about six to seven years before I started seeing it. And and it happened that way. I mean, I it was I don't know, say in the seventh year, something like that. I'm combining, uh, like our farm is over and back is an acre and a quarter. And I had 9,500 John Deere combine. Start at the laneway so the wagons stay on the lane, never go in the field. So I'm combining over, and I'm combining back, and there's a buzzer going off, something I, well, oh, chain off, what's going on? <laughs> okay, so this buzzer is going off, and here's the bin full switch, right? I'm 300 feet from the laneway, and I said, what, what the heck is that? Like in Haldeman County, when you buy a new combine, the bin full switch is optional equipment. <laughs> anyway, so I called up John Hussick. He came down with his way wagon. It was two. It was 230 bushels, and that was into the seventh year. And so I, and it just has just continually gone up from there. Uh, it just amazes me. Where do you dump your corn out far end? Do you need a wagon down there, or do you have a grain bucket that you use? I've traded combines, right. <laughs> so I got a ninety-six. What is it? No, ninety-five sixty. So it's got a big enough bin that I can get over and back. Okay. But it was this not la not this last year. We didn't plant until the. Uh, I think it was the second of June when we planted corn. Like we were just, and we were really, uh, and then we got a frost, and, and so yeah, so it was not a banner year. We still ended up with, I think we, our, our farm average was just 200, and I think our high yield was 269. So we got a kick in the teeth a little bit with this last year. But I've had a couple of times when the bin was full, uh, over and back, so. So I'm hoping that I have to dump at both ends next, yeah. the next step.